Um, I'm going to call us to order, everybody. Uh, we're close enough to one I th or to, to, to noon, I think. So I'll say good good morning to everybody. I want to thank everyone for coming here. Uh, we're very 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 pleased uh, that you're all able to join us. Uh, my name is Dr. Warren Doctor. I am from Granger County. <laughs> um, I'm the president and CEO of the East Tennessee Historical Society, and I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, we're very very pleased to be able to bring you these um, brown bag lectures. Uh, and we are now doing the brown bag lectures part in person as well as online. And so I would like to ask everyone if you could go to our website and register on Eventbrite. You can just go to our w website and click on the lecture thing and you can go ahead and reserve your space for the next, all the lectures for the rest of the year if you want to. So we have those lectures available. Um, I also wanted to draw your attention to uh, anyone who's not a member of the East Tennessee Historical Society. We have membership brochures by the door. Um, obviously, we, we love to bring you these, these, these content and bring in great speakers like Charlie, uh, but we do uh, like to help everyone join the society as well, and any kind of support you can give us is very, very welcome. Um, next, I want to just tell you about some upcoming events we're very excited about in our series. Uh, the next big upcoming event, um, it's actually not a brown bag lecture. It's, in fact, a Tennessee conversation, and it's going to be happening at 6.30 p.m., um, on September 16th at First Presbyterian Church. And it will be, it's called a Tennessee Conversation because uh, former Governor Bill Haslam will be discussing his book on faith in politics with um, Gary Wade. So we're really excited about that event. We think that's going to be uh, a, a really fun, really fun thing to come and listen to. After that, further on in September, our next brown bag launch, which will be here um, at noon on Wednesday, the 22nd of September, um, graduate student Ashley Farrington will be coming to discuss Knoxville's unique race relations and how they affected women's, the movement for women's suffrage in Knoxville. Her talk's called A Delicate Balance, and uh, we're very excited to welcome her and to, and to let her come tell her story. Now today, uh, I'll, I'll move on with all the, the formalities and uh, get right down to the introduction. So joining us today uh, is, is a friend of mine. And we happened to recently go on an adventure together. Um, I did, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we had a very good time around Cane Creek and Fort Loudon and out that way, down towards Teleco. Um, Frank is originally from, excuse me, Frank, sorry, Charlie. I don't, know where, I don't even know who Frank is. Um, <laughs> oh, I tell you what, COVID affects more than your lungs. Um, <laughs> Uh, Charlie is originally from North Carolina, and he's a graduate of Western Carolina University. And he has worked in sort of mu museum work uh, for a very long time. Uh, and he's a man after my own heart because he did some research in Scotland, and I, I did some research in, in Great Britain, so our paths may have crossed at some point. Um, he has worked on Scottish tartans. Uh, you worked at Fort Bragg, and uh, you, you also worked with the Daniel Boone Council. And uh, he's a very, very accomplished man uh, and a good friend. And now he's going to come tell us about the 200th anniversary of the Cher Cherokee Syllabary <laughs> and uh, its creation and how it's being used today. Thank you so much, Charlie. Sure. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I was going to mention this. I'm wondering if there's anybody in this room that's been a member of the Historical Society for 20, oh yeah. No, no, this is oh. This oh. <laughs> Oh, I forgot this one. <laughs> Has anybody been a member for like 21 years with the Historical Society? Do you, did you go to a, uh, the awards dinner like 21 years ago? <laughs> that is a good thing. <laughs> I had just gotten to the Sequoia Birthplace Museum, and the, the director back then uh, had... In, he called up and he wanted me to come and introduce the speaker for that that year's awards and uh, dinner and the guy had a one syllable name and I got up and I butchered his name trying to introduce and I kept telling I didn't want to do this I don't introduce people very well I just I lose it when I'm trying to introduce folks and so I ended up butchering this guy's name and I remember at some point saying you think a guy with a name like Road Armor could get this guy's name <laughs> So I've never been asked to inter, uh, introduce anybody for since. So um, 
Well, I hope everybody's had their lunch. Uh, when it comes supper time, we'll call over to the Irish pub and have them send food over. Um, I didn't hear you laugh. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> um, this talk is actually about three, maybe four talks all rammed. It's a train wreck into one. So we're going to kind of see how this goes. Um, and uh, so we'll just jump in. I tried to get here early so I could slow down so I wouldn't be talking 100 miles an hour. So uh, just to begin with, my first, when I was asked what the title was, the first title I had was Sequoia's Trail to the Bicentennial of the Cherokee Syllabary from the Handwritten Word to the Acorn uh, Press. So, and then I said, <laughs> if you want something shorter, the Trail of the Syllabary. So, um, so to begin with, um, this is the Bicentennial. It was 1821 when Sequoia actually finished his syllabary and it was presented before the elders and the elders accepted that this wasn't witchcraft, this wasn't evil. Um, a lot of the Cherokees looked at him as being insane, being crazy. Uh, if, if the creator had wanted them to read and write, he'd already given them that ability. And so a lot of the traditional Cherokees just thought he was insane for even attempting to try to do this. And so it was a 12 year journey uh, to the point where he finally finished the syllabary 200 years ago this year. To kind of begin with, Sequoia is born near uh, or um, at the village of Tuskegee, uh, which is on the Tennessee River, now called the Little Tennessee. And so he's, he grows up, he's raised in that area, and he spends most of his life there in the Tennessee Overhill or the Cherokee Overhill. And there's one of the things that I talk about and what I've found over the 20 years of being there is there's certain things that we know that's carved in stone with Sequoia. And then, then there's things that um, are exaggerations. I mean, we know that there's truth in it, to what degree, you know, it's been, it's been blown up a little bit. And then we kind of, that, that's where we start stepping over into the tall tales where it's just bizarre. I mean, we think there's probably some truth to it. Uh, there's something connected, but, you know, and then it goes over the hill into the manure pile, which is just out and out lies, total BS that has been fabricated for whatever reason. Uh, ignorance or just for whatever. Uh, probably one of my best, the one that, that I like, because everybody goes, oh, let's see, how far can I go away? Oh, good. So, you know, when you look at the syllabary, you see syllables, you see symbols that we recognize. And so there's one of those tall tales that crossed over the hill into the manure pile is that, uh, oh, it looked like this. Sequoia was walking down the road one day and he found a bunch of papers on the side of the road and he picks these papers up and he studies them and he takes them back and he creates his symbols from these pieces of paper that had Greek and German and French and English uh, all mixed on there. And uh, so that's why it looks like that. Well, that sounds good. Yeah, I buy it. You know, but to me, that was somebody of ignorance that just, well, someone was asked and they didn't know the answer. So they gave them that answer. Um, actually, it looks like that because they had to buy a printing press. And so we'll get more into that story of how the syllabary becomes that. So, so uh, he's born near the village. His mother is Werta. Werta is of the Paint Clan. She's a very powerful family. Uh, her father, her uncles, or headmen, leaders within the clan, within the, in the nation. And so she gives Sequoia a very traditional upbringing. Um, uh, she gives him an English name, George Gist, which he uses throughout his life. But he also uses uh, Sequoia which can translate into Cher or from Cherokee to English to mean pig's foot. <laughs> Why do we call him pig's foot? He had a physical challenge. We, I found over 25 different reasons why he limped. And they ranged the most common one, he was wounded as a boy in a hunting accident, almost dies, but he, he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. Other stories, he had club foot, deformed foot, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, some say he was wounded at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. That's where he got the limp. So, like I say, kind of going into those tall tales and the exaggerations, we just don't know. But there's, like I say, I found 25 reasons why he had that limp. Um, so, his father is a guy named Nathaniel Gist. And Nathaniel is actually a fur trader that had been coming into the Cherokee Overhill since the 1750s. And he happened to be buddies with George Washington. 
and what's about to happen in 1776. Washington knows he's good friends with the Cherokee, and so Washington asked him to go talk to the Cherokee about not coming in on the side of the British if and when war broke out. And so some of us know, you know, the British have been, and the Cherokee have been pretty good buddies there for, except for a few years back in the 1750s and early 60s. So, so anyhow, he travels in in 1775, 1776, and possibly again in 1777. So it's one of those three years that Sequoia is born. And... Um, so to kind of what we've got up here now as Sequoia is growing up and Thomas Jefferson came up with the Americanization program, which was to turn all natives into like little European settlers. So you could put them on 50, 75 acre farms. They grow their own food. They sell the surplus, raise cattle, you know, feed themselves, sell the surplus of cattle. Uh, the women would learn to spin, weave, um, make butter and cheese. And so they would end up the Cherokee or the Creek or, you know, Catawba, whoever, every nation, all the tribes would end up living on these little farms and basically becoming like settlers. And the point of the whole thing was, if you're living on a 50, 75 acre farm, you don't need parts of like for the Cherokee, eight parts, you know, eight parts of states to go deer hunting in to feed your people anymore. And so what do you do with all that extra land? So it was about kind of getting the land. Um, so, but a part of that Americanization, they would build what they called the factory. And the Teleco Blockhouse was built, if you're familiar with Fort Loudon State Historic Area, you've got Fort Loudon, which the Cherokee lay siege to and take uh, in 1760, and it goes to ruins. Well, by the formation of the United States government, uh, I think it was around 17, it was 94, uh, they built the Teleco Blockhouse. And that was to keep whites from sneaking in and encroaching on Cherokee territory. So they were running patrols out of the blockhouse. They also um, uh, were, uh, if you needed to go and do business with somebody in the Cherokee Nation, with Chief Ross or with Sequoia, you had to come to the blockhouse and you would actually get a pass to go into the nation. You would conduct your business and then you would come back and check out at the blockhouse. And so, uh, as time went by, I guess I jumped a little bit too fast. If you look back here in the back portion, this was added, call, it was called the factory. And the factory was a trading post. It was a teaching place where they taught them the animal husbandry, cash crops, spinning, weaving, butter and cheese and all that. And so that was kind of on the back side. Now Sequoia at this point is living a mile and a quarter from where Nine Mile Creek runs into the Tennessee. And that's where this is sitting. So he's a mile and a quarter from there. And so this would have been the mall, the plaza. This would have been the place to have gone. And so uh, it also had a blacksmith shop up this, out over here. And the blacksmith shop plays a part in Sequoia. Uh, Sequoia as a boy growing up, he would build these little houses and people were amazed at the detail that he would put in these houses. He started drawing pictures and people referred to, you could look at one of his bison drawings and it looked just like a bison. And as he got older, he started drawing pictures of people and you could look at one of his pictures and you could recognize the person that he had drawn. So he's very artistic, very talented, very good with his hands. He teaches himself to silversmith and then he ends up learning to blacksmith. And this would have been where, to me, this is a very important site to the Cherokee. Um, there's another little story that, that has some truth in it, but it's been mixed up because people didn't quite understand or know or remember you know, you've heard, I don't know, some of you may have heard the story that Sequoia sees the soldier at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, and they're sending orders, writing out orders on a piece of paper, and, and he's amazed that, you know, this little piece of paper goes to Captain Smith, and Captain Smith, Captain Smith have 100 men at the Forks of the River on Thursday, and, you know, on Thursday there's Captain Smith with 100 men at the Forks of the River, and Sequoia's amazed that this little piece of paper could teach or t t tell somebody to do that. And so he's thinking about, you know, how to create a writing system. How do we put our Cherokee words on paper just like the English put theirs? And so, when we, well, I need to tell you another little piece of information. So um, it's in 1809, he's learned to blacksmith, and he would have learned to blacksmith here at the blockhouse. So in 1809, he learns to blacksmith, and it's in his blacksmith shop. He announces to a group of Cherokee, hey, we could create a writing system. So in 1809, he began his journey, 12 years to 1821, for uh, creating the syllabary. 
Now, who knows when the Battle of Horseshoe Bend was? Oh, that was, when was the War of 1812? That's the answer for that one. <laughs> Add two. 14. 14. There he is. Oh, I should have brought some prizes to give out. Oh, gone. Ran out of the museum, forgot the prize. So 1814 is the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. When did I say Sequoia announced say we could create a writing system? 1809. 1809. He's already been working on the writing system for five years. So where did he see those soldiers? The blockhouse. So to me, this is one of those important sites that, that has been overlooked. And like I say, the stories kind of go around and people just kind of, well, he was in the army, that's where he saw the soldiers, down at Horseshoe Bend. No, it's five years earlier, up at the Telco blockhouse. That's where he sees it. He sees them reading books, writing letters, and he starts pondering about the fact we could create, we could put our words on paper. And so that's where I think the spark began. So. Get off my soapbox. But <laughs> um, the, the Fort Loudoun State Historic Area has built the, uh, 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 one of the block houses in the corner. And so it's another place for me to put a different set of clothes on and go play. So if some of you know, I do a lot of different living history periods. So I'm looking forward to going and hanging out at the block house. So, and this is the, the footprint of the block house. Of course, the, uh, uh, it's a little dark, but the, the factory was down on that lower level, and then this was the upper level that had the barracks and the officers' offices and, and so on. So here we are at the blacksmith shop, 1809, he announces we could create that writing system. So he begins working there. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know and realize is that Sequoia actually created a numbering system first. He developed a numbering system so he could keep accounts. Now, my background is criminal justice, and so I'm one of these people that kind of go around looking for evidence, and Sequoia's a wonderful subject. I guess that's why I've hung around so long. It's kind of digging out these little pieces. And I actually blacksmith, I worked as a blacksmith through college, put myself through college. And the thing is, I never had a problem ever remembering what people owed me for my work. What Sequoia did is his problem was he couldn't remember what people owed him for the work that he did. And so he devises this numbering system, which he turns into an accounting system to be able to remember what people owe him for his work that he does. Um, this is the numbering system. If you look up at the top, it's 1 through 20, and then 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 on the bottom line. And then if you look, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 lines down, just in, that's 1,000. And if you look right here, that's one million. So, so Coy developed his numbering system and he used that as an accounting system in his blacksmith shop. Now, uh, this is from the Gilcrease Museum. It's a reproduction at our museum, but the original's at the Gilcrease out in Oklahoma. And if you notice, here's the new syllabary, the new syllabary, the Cherokee syllabary, the new syllabary. This is those characters for the printing press. And then Sequoia has signed it down here. And one lady had asked earlier, say Koya, how many syllables? Three. So it should be three symbols. But Sequoia actually used kind of this S, an extra S in there. And so um, now there is one story that you could change a couple of the syllables or a syllable and it turned the meaning into crane or principal bird. And so some feel that he actually started calling himself or had, somebody started calling him Principal Bird or Crane later on. So. And this kind of explains about the numbers and then that silent or S, extra S. Okay. So Sequoia is creating his syllabary. What he ends up coming up with is he creates his symbols out of his own mind by his own hand. They didn't really exist anywhere else in the world. And so if you look up here, there is a couple of symbols that we do recognize. I would say if you look up that second box on the first, he saw sheet music, can't talk, he saw sheet music, and he liked that symbol. If you look around, you'll see like, that looks like as. Um, there's like an H, a six. So you see some symbols that resemble, but typically these are symbols that he creates in his own mind by his own hand. So they didn't exist anywhere else in the world. And so this is what he introduces 
to the elders in 1821, and they're accepted by the tribe, and it becomes the official writing system for the Cherokee Nation. And so as soon as uh, this becomes the official writing system, of course, the nation says, okay, we need, we need a printing press. We've got to print stuff. We've got to print the Bible, a newspaper. We've got to do all kinds of printing. So what happens is they uh, contact Elias Boutonot. And uh, so Elias Boutonot is sent to go and investigate buying a press. Well, apparently he finds out very quickly they can't afford to buy a printing press and all the type that they need. They want English type and they want the Cherokee, the, the Sequoia syllabary type. But Sequoia's type didn't exist. And so you had to, would have had to make thousands of these characters to be able to print a book, a Bible, newspaper. And so they couldn't afford to buy the press. So at some point, I've been finding, I've been doing some recent research and some of the old stuff I've done before. Um, I have a feeling that it was actually Elias Boutonot and Reverend Samuel Wooster that probably sat down, maybe a couple of other Cherokees, and they actually went through and developed this syllabary. Now, this one's a different font. This is one of those modern fonts. This is like, not really like that font very well, but that's what's there. But, oh, look at this one. This was a good one. So this is the syllabary that we came to know in, by 1827, uh, by the time the printing press was bought and by the time they started printing the newspaper. And so it's obvious that Sequoia learned the new symbols because he had written them out underneath his numbers. Um, and so if you look, that top letter, that exists, that exists, that exists, cheaper, 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 it made it cheaper to buy the printing press because a lot of these symbols already existed. So the moles, the, the casting and the making of the type was a whole, it, like any other, like making English. So it reduced the cost of buying the press. And um, there's a few symbols up there that are like, um, there's Greek symbols, there's some German symbols. Um, uh, there's one symbol, uh, well, anyhow, but there's a number of different symbols, but they existed. So it made it cheaper to buy the press. And there's a few symbols where they put lines through it or tails on them. It makes it look different. And then there's a few symbols that exist nowhere else in the world, and that makes it uniquely Cherokee. And so, um, so there we are with that. So, so Elias Bunot and um, Reverend Wooster and probably others come up with these, these and then they order, and, uh, order the printing press. Now, the press that he gets is uh, it's called a Union, uh, a Union Acorn Royal Printing Press. And the Royal is a size of paper uh, that's printed on, on the press itself. So that, the Royal is, kind of denotes the size of paper. But it's a Union Acorn Press. Now, this is not as defined an acorn, but you'll see a, a better shape in a, of an acorn press in just a little bit. But this is the, the Union Press. I think this one's out in California. We were able to find two, and one, both of those were in museums, and of course they wouldn't let us get our grubby little hands on them. So, uh, so anyhow, we did find two Union Presses, and um, it's kind of uh, one of the things is I noticed the, the stars that are cast into the, into the frame. Uh, they're very elegant pieces of equipment. Um, and. What we ended up, uh, like I say, we looked uh, for the Union Press but could not find one. But what we did find, I met a gentleman, Mr. Jacobson, in, uh, on the phone and told him what we were doing. And he actually, his business, uh, he's retired now and his son runs the business. But he built these giant presses for like um, the uh, Times News, uh, the Washington Press, whatever, you know, all these giant newspapers. He would install these presses. And so he'd traveled all over the world, and when he on these travels, he would find or see printing presses. He'd buy them and ship them back to New Jersey. And so he, after, he found this one in Boston. It was actually built in Boston. And uh, it's, the, uh, it's an 1833 Otis Tufts Acorn printing press. And you can certainly see that shape. And that's kind of why they were called Acorn presses. And they all have the same design. They, the mechanics all work the same. 
And so that was the whole point, was we wanted to get a printing press as close to the press that they used in uh, New Echota printing the Cherokee Phoenix. Um, and so Mr. Jacobson actually donated half of the press to us, and he helped us in ever with uh, our type cabinet and a lot of different advice and uh, getting started. And so, um, so this is what we've been actually using. When we set it up, uh, there's a gentleman here in town, Brian Baker, who's striped light, uh, letterpress, it's over off of? Central. 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 What? Central. 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 I, see, I, I'm half deaf too. <laughs> so, but it's just off Central. And uh, so if you ever need any printing press work done, invitations, hand done, Brian's your man. <laughs> He's put up with my silliness. So. Uh, and helped me to learn. Um, and so uh, Brian helped uh, come down. He's been coming down. We started back in February, and for the first several months, it was organizing the type. And uh, voila, that's how the type comes from the type foundry. Uh, it's, all little, it's all little pieces, and they're all then bundled up, tied around with string, and then they're wrapped in newspaper. They got like cardboard tops or uh, wood or cardboard on bottom and top. And then they're wrapped in newspaper. And um, so once you take the newspaper off and you cut those strings, you got a mess if you're not very careful. So, um, and then just a sideline is um, where all this began, it was, uh, of course, it began in 1821 with him finishing the print, <laughs> but, but uh, recent times, uh, this was actually done by Frank Brannan, and this was his master's um, thesis or his master's paper, and what he actually did, he wrote the Cherokee Phoenix uh, Advocate uh, of the Newspaper, the Print Shop of the Cherokee Nation, 1828 to 1834, and so what he did is he did his paper, then he made this paper, then he printed it on this paper, and then he made this book. <laughs> and so that was his for his uh, masters. And so uh, Frank had a lot of good information in here that he had found um, when he was doing his research. But he also was instrumental in getting in touch with Ed, uh, who works and owns Swamp Press Foundry. And at Swamp Press Foundry, just to kind of flip through there, I mean, I don't, can't know you can't see, but I mean, there's just all kinds of different fonts that you can order. And, um, and of course, here's his Cherokee. So you can order it. And he's actually out of it. We bought all they had left. <laughs> when we started printing, we started running out of uh, symbols or syllables. And so we ended up ordering everything he had left so that we could finish printing our syllabary. And um, so, so that this whole project has been... We started a year, two years before we actually started renovating the museum. Uh, so we're looking at five years ago when we finally got the Union Acorn Press. And then it was a matter of tracking down the type and tracking down you know, the equipment that we needed, uh, the cabinet to store the type in. And then um, uh, here's the type drawers. And this was something that, that a gentleman, I was doing a program, a Skype, a uh, Zoom program to the Going Snake Historical Society in Oklahoma, and I have the type drawer pulled out, and I happen to be standing there with the type drawer like here and holding the syllabary like this, and one of the gentlemen pointed out, hey, that's probably the organization for the type drawer. And it was like, duh. So Reverend Wooster actually did, and I have found, it was in one of the two books, Reverend Wooster did organize the type cabinet, and that's what he used to organize the type in the drawers. And it just so happens, Brian followed in the same footsteps. We, he just took, I printed him off on the Xerox, one of the syllabaries. He started cutting out the symbols, gluing them onto the cardboard, and then sticking the cardboard in the little cubby holes. And voila, we had the Cherokee's type organized so that we could find it easier. And that was one of the problems the Cherokees had. Their first two printers did not read Cherokee. And so there was actually a, a half-blood that came in, and, and they actually started jurying him as a printer, and he was actually the one that was starting to do the Cherokee syllabary. So, um, Excuse me? Yes, ma'am. Are there capital letters as well as lowercase? 
Um, that's funny. Uh, they're all they're all one size. There's no. Are they look the same too? Right. Um, well, let me let me find. A, um, let me go through the process and remind me if I don't answer this. So, so you start by you know having your type organized, and then you go and you get the composing stick. This is one of my favorite tools. It's just you, I don't know what it is about these. So. You get the composing stick, and what you basically do is you kind of work about you know, four or five lines at a time, a paragraph at a time. And so you pull the type and you put it in the, in the, the composing stick, and so we could do really wide or we can adjust this to, you know, down to here. So we can adjust it to whatever the column size is, and then that's we would organize our type in here first, and then we'd transfer it over to, um, what's the, the outer? Oh. The chase. Ah, thank you. <laughs> You've printed before? Oh, the chase. So you put the type in the chase and then lock it all in. So, but you start with this. This is where it begins. Um, and pulling that e each individual type. Um, and here's Brian uh, actually working on one of the composing sticks. And now, and this is something to point out, okay? Once you set your type, you know, if you look at this, you know, you've got your type that's going to be printed, and then you've got these big holes. Well, that's spacers. So you've got to put those spacers in to fill that up, and the type can't move at all. So you've got to put the type in, and you put the spacers in, and if it's still wiggling a little bit, you use these little brass, brass or coppers, and you use those to slide down in there to wedge those spaces so that they'll lock in. And they, so you, once you put, you've got coins that you lock in, they're little wedges, and so the type can't move. Because if it moves slightly, this is lead, and your platen is actually steel, and you usually use a spacer in between, like cardboard. And so if it's leaning, it's going to squish and deform your, your type. So you don't want that to happen. And then here is what our project that we're doing this year. Uh, is our Cherokee syllabary, our bicentennial Cherokee syllabary. And what we started, uh, Brian started helping get the layout. Uh, I actually went up to his shop and worked. He, he actually gives the classes so you can get individual classes and learn about uh, letterpress, which is one of those things I never had an idea that I'd even have a like for, much less I'm, had, I'm developing love for it. It's like, it's, it's very fun, very interesting. And so what we did is um, we looked at some of the other syllabaries. There's a couple of different syllabaries out there. The most common one was probably done back either between the 1920s or more than likely was done in the 1960s or 70s. And that was Brian could identify the type that they used down for the description uh, or the pronunciation guide. And that type had not been developed until like 1820s, or excuse me, 1920s. And so... Um, and he just kind of looking at it, kind of felt that that was created probably back in maybe in the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s at the latest. So, and so what we did is we actually found, I found the first one. This is the kind of the syllabary chart that Elias, uh, excuse me, Reverend Samuel Wooster did. And Reverend Wooster actually did this a pronunciation chart for Cherokee down here at the bottom. And one of the things that we noticed that I've gotten comments is he has a P in part of the, in the list of sounds that the Cherokee make. And most Cherokees will say, we don't make a P sound. But if you listen very closely, there's a couple in here that you could add a P in there if you were writing it out phonetically. And so we think Reverend Wooster added that P, but then when the other sound uh, pronunciation guide was done, they dropped the, that P. So... Um, so basically what we did is we based uh, this off of Reverend Wooster and the, the sound, and then we created, um, well, the syllabary, uh, Cherokee syllabary, the dates, and then Sequoia Birthplace Museum in Cherokee, and then we created the, the Cherokee phrase, which basically translates into the bicentennial of Sequoia's writing system, 200 years of literacy. And so, um, so when we first did, the first thing that we did... Notice, bad, bad. I only kept one because once we, we kind of did it and I talked to one speaker reader 
and we kind of put it together. We started printing it, and, we, and these were the ones that we actually tested our printer on, printing press on. And this press, what, it was made in 1833. It probably has not been used really since the 1850s. Uh, when Mr. Jacobson found it, it was down in a basement in Boston in a print shop, and they were using it for shelving. They just had stuff piled on it. And so it hadn't been used in years. And Brian brought it up, or excuse me, uh, we brought it up, got it put together. And then when Brian got there, we started, he started tinkering with it. When we got the, this phrase done, we put it in the press, a couple of tries. He adjusted one spring. He tried again. He put the spring right back where it was. And so we did not have to adjust the press at all. And so, but we got this bad phrase, and I kind of keep this to remind me. The rule is... Cherokee Council had passed a resolution actually about two months ago that anything published in the syllabary had to be reviewed by at least three speaker readers before it could be disseminated to the public. So, so from now on, we have to, whatever we're going to do in the syllabary will be sent to the Speakers Guild to be reviewed now. So, and another, another kind of, this was like our final proof and I'd taken it over to Cherokee, North Carolina and was all proud and I went into the Museum of the Cherokee Indian and the new director was there and uh, the, the intermediate director, Dawn uh, Arniche, who I've known for years, um, and they came down and as soon as I had this and I was like showing this, stuck it out in front of Dawn and Dawn goes, that's upside down. Ah! <laughs> so, so anyhow, we came back and of course I drew a big circle, but you gotta turn that around and then then I took a syllabary that we knew was right, and I went through and I checked every single letter and made sure. And then I think Brian did the same thing. So, and then I actually had a friend that come in, and I didn't realize he was a proofreader, because I asked, would you proofread this? And the next thing I know, I get all these red marks back here from the bottom. <laughs> so anyhow, that's one of the things I've learned. Get as many eyes on it to be proofed so that you don't have a mistake. But there's always sometimes a mistake, so. Um, so the project this year is actually um, creating the syllabaries on this and, and what we're actually doing, we're doing three different ones at this moment and the, uh, um, we're printing on archival paper, 100% cotton um, and we're, we're doing these limited, they're under 175 of these that we're printing and we're selling these for $75. And so uh, we're doing on the far end and selling these in our gift shop. Did I mention the gift shop? <laughs> um, we're selling these in the gift shop. It's just on light parchment paper. These are like $20. And, of course, it's got the sequoia. And we could print up to 600 of these if we wanted to. So I doubt we'll print up to 600 of them. But um, uh, we could, and then we're actually, we've got gold parchment that we're printing this, the same thing on gold parchment, and we've got uh, 200 sheets of that, so we could print up to about 200 of those, and those are for members. Anybody that's a member this year uh, gets one of those. If you join, it's $30, and you get an individual membership for buying that particular syllabary. So if anybody's interested, you can call down the museum or come down the museum, and we have the gold parchment one and you get a membership with that one. So uh, we've actually already set up, and I've got to get them proofed, is I'm, we're, doing a, we're going to do a series for the Museum of the Cherokee Indian that will have that right there, and then we're doing only two for the Trail of Tears uh, Association. So we're going to do um, those. And then the plan is by December, January, what we will do is we'll take all the bicentennial things off and um, we'll actually print just a blank. It'll have the syllabary and the pronunciation, but it'll be blank here. And so anybody that wants to print a syllabary for their site, like you know, Museum of the Cherokee Indian, the Tennessee, East Tennessee Historical, we'll actually be able to insert their information in, in here. So this is one of the things that's kind of turned into a kind of a side business for the museum. Um, so, uh, and this is kind of, while we're here, before I forget, this is like a, 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 once you ink it, you print it, and then these are called ghost prints, which is really cool. Like, 
at the end of the day when you're ready to start cleaning it up, you can start taking and you just keep putting the paper on but not inking it. And you just kind of, it kind of goes out. So that's one of those little fun things to do. <laughs> um, so one of the other sidelines that we're wanting to do is, and I've talked with the speakers uh, in Cherokee, is any of the speakers, any of the, they want to create poems or we would like them to help us create like uh, birthday cards, Christmas cards, Valentine's Day cards, Mother's Day, Father's Day, create them in Cherokee, put them on paper in Cherokee, but then, and not even think about it in English, and then translate it to English. And so we would create these cards, and then it would kind of be like our syllabary, is once we create a, a really good card for Christmas or whatever, is then we would have, actually have uh, a plates made so that we could make those cards you know, throughout the year uh, for people. So. Uh, and then here's our acorn press um, with actually one of the first syllabaries printed on it. So, and then this is uh, the Cherokee Phoenix. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, the Cherokees wanted a newspaper. They wanted to 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 communicate. And I guess I, the the best thing I found. I typically don't like to read, but um, I found this, and this is actually. Uh, Elias Boutnot, and he went around in 1826 doing fundraising, trying to raise money. The, the nation actually gave him, I think it was $1,500 towards the press, and then they sent Elias forth to go fundraise the rest of it. And they ended up actually, um, they ended up borrowing money uh, from the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Ministries. Their mission was actually, and part of what they did was to try to get uh, printing presses so that they could translate the Bible not only for the Cherokee but other tribes and nations and so but they actually gave a loan and that loan was paid off within a year uh, for the press so um, but Elias says uh, the why I mean the reason for a newspaper is such a paper composing uh, a summary of religious and political events on the one hand and on the other hand uh, exhibiting the feelings, disposition, improvements, and the prospects of the Indians, their traditions, their true character, as it once was, and as it is now, or it now is. Um, the ways and means most likely to throw the mantle of civilization over all tribes, and such other matter as will tend to diffuse proper and correct impressions in regard to their condition. Uh, such a paper could not fail to create much interest in American community uh, favorable to the aboriginals and to have a powerful influence on the advancement of the Indians themselves. And so that was kind of, it was not only to communicate with them as the Cherokee Nation, but it was also to communicate with the world, uh, to let them know what was happening and especially as removal was coming and all those things were happening, um, you know, uh, there was actually, uh, not to go off, uh, there's a ton of programs and things that could be done out of this, but one of the examples was that they were, they were writing about the missionaries, Reverend Wooster and uh, I think Butler, Butler that was arrested and actually there was t 10 men, but uh, most of them said, okay, we'll leave you know, because they wouldn't sign an oath of allegiance to the Georgia um, and being a white man in the Cherokee Nation. And so they were arrested and they were tried and then they were actually took a pardon to leave except for Reverend Wooster and Butler. And that's where we get Wooster versus Georgia. And it's the Supreme Court decision basically saying the Cherokees are a sovereign nation and Andrew Jackson ignored it and um, didn't enforce it. And so then that led on to the removal. But um, Reverend Wooster, oh, see, I got on that sidetrack now. I don't know where I'm supposed to be. Uh, uh, it's not a train wreck yet, but it's getting there. Um, <laughs> so, oh, oh, the reason for the press. <laughs> so that's what the, the, pre, the, the newspaper, um, when they started writing comments about what had been happening to the missionaries, 
And the public opinion was, well, if the United States government, if Georgia would do this to missionaries, what are they doing to the poor Cherokee? And so it did help with public opinion about the Cherokee. And uh, it was something I wanted to point out on that newspaper, but that one went off from the wayside, but we'll move on. And... Aha, here's a good story. <laughs> so um, everybody knows where a paper mill is, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, let me back up. Brian Baker happens, he has letterpress or uh, striped light there off of Central, but he also works doing the computer, um, he's a computer guru at McKay's bookstore. You know, bookstores, CDs, music, all that stuff. Well, so we're working, putting the type together, and we're talking about all this stuff, and then there, I find this piece of information. When the Cherokee go by, when they bought the printing press, the Union Acorn Press, it was shipped out of Boston with the type, and I, I assumed that the paper was with it, and they just let, they didn't, once they loaded it, they couldn't get the paper in the wagon, because the press itself's over 2,000 pounds. And then imagine, you've got all this type to be able to print, well, <laughs> you've got all this lead type to print a four-page newspaper, so you can imagine how heavy all this weight was. And so they loaded it into the wagon, down in Augusta and they brought it up. But one thing I read just actually last night was that they left the paper in Boston. And so for whatever reason, they brought, they went and picked up the press down in Augusta and brought it up to New Echota and they unloaded it, started putting it together, getting it set up. And then, um, oh, I remember the guy, uh, one of the printers actually got a wagon and came up to Knoxville, Tennessee to get the paper. Well, Brian and I are working away, and guess what? All these, you know, ooh, this is just too good. Brian works at McKay's Books. It's on uh, Paper Mill Road. Uh, the Cherokees came from, you know, Georgia up to Paper Mill Road to get the paper. I mean, this is incredible, and it's like somewhere there's a sign. And so I came up three times looking for that sign, and I never looked in the right spot. And uh, so Brian actually found it, and so one day, we were buying the last of the paper for our, uh, the archival paper. And so I went by, I bought the paper, had it in a roll. It was rolled up. And that's another thing I found out. That's how they shipped the paper. They, when they would, they would roll the paper up, then they had to unroll it, wet it, and let it settle back down and flatten out. And so I'm just like, oh, this is just so great. So <laughs> anyhow, so we, I'm following Brian from the paper company or where we got the paper and he pulls in I pull in I jump out I grab the paper I grab my phone I get it on the, the picture and I just hand him my phone as I go and it's, I'm standing in the sign going take my picture so he takes the picture and then I take Brian's picture and then I turn around and I look up at the sign and what's the dates on the sign 1838 the first issue of the Cherokee Phoenix is printed on the 21st of February, 1828. <laughs> Don't you know how disappointing that was to figure that out? Because <laughs> I turned around and went, 1838? Uh, they didn't get it here. So, <laughs> oh, I'm never satisfied until I can say, you know, so, and guess who? It happened to be uh, Joe Emmert. I had talked to Joe, and Joe came by and talked to one of the archivists, archivists or somebody here, and he actually sent me, um, uh, it was the French Broad Holston County, a uh, country, a history of Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, in 1946. And basically, the information is that they were, there were uh, a number of the uh, information gathered from the Bureau of Census in 1820 reports one paper mill in Knox County uh, with an annual production of $1,200. Um, there's others from 1820 to 1830. There are numerous advertisements for Knoxville newspapers regarding paper mills. 1820, um, uh, Jacob uh, Harmon advertised that he wanted to rent his half of the paper mill, therefore to conduct. Da -da -da. So we know they came to Knoxville and they repeatedly came up to Knoxville to get their paper. And so 
you know, that's a kind of a tie to the Cherokee Phoenix. Oh, that's what I wanted to tell you about when the Phoenix was up there. Oh, yeah, that paper came from Knoxville, Tennessee. So they did go to Augusta a few times apparently to get paper, and that was one of the problems that they had um, with the whole process um, is that they would run out of um, they would run out of paper, they would run out of ink, and it was actually I, that was one of the things. I, I know I'd read this somewhere over the 21 years I've been here, and I'd ask a couple of young men that wanted to do some research, and I said, find out about how many, what was the circulation, what was the, um, you know, what did they print? Was it a, you know, I, was it a weekly newspaper? or Typically, like the Knoxville Gazette, they printed when they had enough news and enough advertisement. And so it was kind of sporadic when the Knoxville Gazette came out. And I was assuming the same thing with the Phoenix. But no, the Phoenix was a, it was a weekly newspaper, but then they had the problems. Uh, sickness was a big problem that one of the printers, the printers would get sick and they would delay in getting the printing done. Um, they would run out of paper, run out of ink. Um, and so, and another thing was running out of mail, um, or excuse me, the mail would be delayed. And so they couldn't add the little outside snippets into the paper. And so that was a problem that they faced. And I actually found one uh, a description that they had printed up the paper and the mail service had picked up the bundles of papers and the courier fell off his horse into a creek. Um, and they said he was okay. They, they apparently saved him, but it took him seven hours to find his dispatch bag. And I think it was the postmaster was, had written back to Elias Bootnot saying, well, all the addresses are gone off the bundles, but we'll roll them out and dry them. <laughs> so, so um, and that was a major problem in the beginning was that they were trying, the, the, way, the mail routes and trying to get the subscriptions to people. And uh, they actually redid the mail service. And so there by 1834, by the end of the newspaper, um, Mail was, they were receiving mail less than a week from, New, uh, from Washington, D.C. to New Echota. So they could get mail within less than a week. So they improved the mail system. <laughs> so, um, so that was kind of the, the sad part, but also the happy part. Digging in there, we thought there was just so many connections with, with uh, uh, Brian and myself and the paper mill, but just didn't work. So, and then here we have Sequoia. Uh, this is, uh, the, uh, Sequoia went to Washington, D.C. in 1828, uh, was part of a treaty group. Uh, the U.S. government wanted the land that they had given the Cherokee out in Arkansas. Guess what? They wanted it back. And so a group of Cherokee went from Arkansas back to Washington and Basically, the government wouldn't let them leave until they signed the treaty, but they kept saying, we're not authorized to give the land up. We can't do that. And the government would say, well, you can't go. And so finally, the group actually did sign the treaty, basically saying, you have to have this ratified by the Cherokee Nation. This means absolutely nothing because we don't have the right. But finally, they, they released Sequoia and the others uh, to go back. And so Sequoia returns back to Arkansas, packs up. And so by 1829, He's moved over to the Indian Territory, and he's already living in the Indian Territory where the nation will be forcibly removed by 1838-39. So. Any questions? So, any insight as to how he figured out exactly how many syllables he needed? I mean, if I think about English and, and trying to make a syllable, uh, for every syllable in English to make a it's a stunning achievement. Is there any insight from him or anybody else how it was done? This is me thinking over the years what I tell people is that um, there's a number of stories that how he comes up the spark. That uh, there's the, what we show in our second theater is like he and Aoka are kind of, you know, and Aoka comes up wanting to work and help him and, and he kind of goes, oh, Aoka, you know, Aoka, Aoka. And it's like, say, cool, yeah. You know, and it kind of that's how he breaks out the symbol. My favorite story is he's listening to the birds out in the woods, and he hears the repetitive sounds in the bird song, and he starts thinking about it, and that's when he starts listening to his family, his friends, and his neighbors, and starts pulling out those little repetitive 
sounds. Now, we know his original syllabary had 87 symbols, so 87 sounds. But when they go to uh, the Cherokee syllabary, the new syllabary, that only has 86 sounds. And there was a period that they dropped one of those sounds as well, so there was only 85 syllables in the syllabary. But a number of, uh, within the last five years, I think, the Cherokee Speakers Guild has put that 86 symbol back. So, you know, and to me, that's the thing. I mean, even with the Cherokee in the nation, people, and even over in Cherokee now, you go up in Big Cove, they say it one way. You go over to Snowbird, they'll say it another way. And you'll go to Yellow Hill, and they'll say it another way. And that's, you know, within two-hour drive of each other. And so imagine the nation, part of eight states, you know, and trying to break those little syllables out. Whew. Yeah, so. And it reads left to right. Is that, am I right? Yeah, just like, yeah, just like us. And it, well, this is one of the things that Brian and I kind of looked at and figured out is we can tell if they were educated in Eng being able to read and write English when we see letters or printing. Because what will happen is the, the ones that are just Cherokee, that only speak and read Cherokee, they don't use punctuation. It's just the lines just continue. But then the ones that could read and write English, they actually add commas and periods and or explanation points or the, uh, punctuation. So. Um, Did you say whether or not Sequoia spoke English and read English? I believe he spoke. English, and there is possible evidence that he learned to write English later on. But uh, as according to, he never went to any of the missionary schools, any of the, the uh, you know, Spring Place, Brainerd, or there was a, Kahiti had a, uh, the Moravians had a, a school probably 10 miles, five miles from Sequoia. So there's no evidence that he ever went to school, learned to read or write English. He did go to a white friend and learn to write his name so he could sign his work. And that's been one of those holy grails when I travel with Trail Tears. Anybody ever seen a piece of silver or anybody seen, you know, GG, George Gist, you know, G Gist. Um, but nobody's ever found that. So, but Sequoia did go and learn to write his name. So. Is there any other language in the world today that uses syllabary? Um, there was actually... Sequoia had this idea that he could create a universal Cherokee language, and several other people had that idea, but they learned very quickly that it wasn't going to work because, you know, yeah, they're a Koyan language set, and then you've got, I don't know, all the other different. So, but then I do, I think there was actually a um, missionary that used Sequoia symbols for some other tribe, other um, out west. Uh, for their language, but it, it, there again, when you look at the syllabary, take English, throw it out the window, it has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's just characters that represent Cherokee sounds. And so, and, and so that when you looked at that other tribal writing, it doesn't have anything to do with Cherokee, it has to do with their sounds. But is there any large language that uses a syllabary? Not that I know. Words, letter just representing a sound? Not that I know of, no. no. Huh. Well, yeah, that's when I'm talking to kids and they're doing a school program, it's like, uh, you know, Sequoia goes through all these different types of writing systems. He tries creating a, a symbol for every sentence. Well, it works for a minute, but imagine every sentence I've used while I've been talking. Boom, you know, my head explodes. <laughs> so he realizes that not, won't work. Then he comes up with a, creating symbols for, sim, uh, for words or concepts. And he starts giving those symbols, well, you know, what is that? Hieroglyphics. Who else has done it? The ancient Egyptians, Chinese, Japanese. Countries, uh, you know, cultures all around the world have based their writing systems on hieroglyphics, and it works. But for poor old Sequoia, he couldn't remember all the symbols, and once again, so he lays that off to the side, and then it's when he hears the sounds and breaks it down to the sounds, the syllable. So it's not an alphabet. We use an alphabet, A, B, C, D, F, G. We put the letters together to create sounds. And then we put the sounds together to create the words. The words create sentences, sentences, paragraphs. So Sequoia didn't go 
another step and create like this symbol and that symbol and that creates, you know, you take these two and put them together to create that symbol or that syllable. You know, he stopped at the sound, the syllable, and didn't go to the alphabet, breaking down the sounds into symbols. Yes, sir. Oops, I knew I was forgetting some. <laughs> okay, this is actually pretty much, um, uh, well, this leads to the, another mystery. Um, uh, what happens is the press actually shuts down, I think it was doo -doo -doo, the last of the paper, the final edition of the Cherokee Phoenix was printed 31st of May, 1835, uh, 1834, and so um, eventually Reverend Wooster live, leaves New Echota in 1835 in April. So they think that uh, Reverend Wooster had actually, his dad had been a printer, and so he knew the processes of printing. And so um, there was a couple of booklets that were, pu that were printed in Cherokee after the, the last paper. So some people feel that it was Elias Boot, excuse me, Reverend Samuel Wooster that went and printed those little booklets. And then there's actually uh, Chief Ross sends a wagon at, later that spring or that summer to go get the press. And apparently there's a whole bit of intrigue because you've got Elias Boutonot and his brother is, I had to make note, oh, Stan Wadey. And we'll hear about Stan Wadey some years down the road. But Stan actually supposedly went and secured the press at one point, And they were still doing some printing on the press in Cherokee. And then the U.S. agent, uh, the United States government agent to the Cherokee, Benjamin, Cur Benjamin Curry, um, ended up getting the press and taking possession of it. And Ross actually writes to him asking for the press, and Curry denies him getting the press back. So the United States government and was involved in confiscating the printing press in the state of Georgia. It was uh, originally confiscated. The, the quick and dirty answer was, oh, the, the Georgia Guard came and confiscated it. Well, they did. But then it kind of dances around with different, the, the, some, some of the pro-removal printed some things on it. And so to try to, I guess, a little psychological warfare against the anti-removal. The, the type was of no value to the United States at all. It just melted down probably. Well, the story is that the type, the Cherokee syllabary type, was thrown down the well. And when they did archaeology there at New Echota, they found a handful of syllabary type in and around the well. But it's a, a handful. Okay, you couldn't hardly print a thank you card with that much type. I mean, it's, so it's, and it's also kind of bizarre because that's lead type. You can melt that down into bullets. You can melt it down to make new type. You can melt it down to do a lot of things. And so it's interesting, but where the, the, the press ended up had, it just disappeared. Now, I did have, I heard one speaker years ago said that there was a, a town about 100 miles away, about a year later, started a newspaper. And it was, the newspaper size was a royal, which was the same size as the Cherokee Phoenix. So one thought is it ended up in that town, uh, but then others, who knows? I mean, it could have ended up, who knows? I mean, it could have been used for scrap in World War I, World War II. Who knows? Yes, ma'am. Um, we have a guest. Uh, we have about 40 people on Zoom with us today. And one of, the, one of our guests has asked, is, can you recommend a good book or an article and just give the particulars about the book so that they know what to look for Okay. Um, to find something to read about the syllabary? Did I mention our gift shop? <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> Okay. Give them the details on how to find you okay. and how to find the book. Visit, visit us at our Facebook page or you, uh, on the internet, Sequoia Birthplace Museum. Uh, we don't really do stuff 
hardcore over the internet. We do, but call us up. We can do things over the phone um, or come by and visit. Um, this is probably one of the best books uh, about Sequoia, Stan Hogue's book on uh, uh, Sequoia, the Cherokee Genius. And Stan kind of, there was a, another book that was done years earlier, um, but Stan based his off of this earlier book. He kind of throws it out there. You know, like I say, there's things that we know is carved in stone, and then there's certain things that are different levels of truth maybe involved. And so Stan kind of just throws it out there and says, so-and-so says this, so-and-so says that. And you kind of, you know, you read it and you kind of make your own decision. And so this has kind of been my book since, well, 21 years. Um, and then uh, on the printing press itself, um, I'd actually read this back when it first came out, but I wasn't even thinking or looking for what I've been looking for now. And so this is uh, the Cherokee newspapers, 1828 to 1906. Um, and the first several chapters are about everything that's going on down with the Phoenix, uh, the Cherokee Phoenix. Um, and uh, there was, well, I don't know if I have time, but uh, there was some interesting, uh, one of the Cherokee writers that he visited uh, a cousin's wedding and he, he basically lays out that the bride was a quarter white, possesses a fine figure, somewhat tall, beautiful complexion with dark hair and eyes. Her features bear uh, the evidence of a ability of good nature and on the whole, she is an interesting woman. She is a member of the Methodist Church. The bridegroom, a cousin of mine, is a full-blooded Indian, an aboriginal, deep copper complexion, low statue, fine figure, but, not, but does not possess a handsome face. <laughs> So even the one, excuse me, even the uh, uh, Cherokee Phoenix had a little bit of um, high society <laughs> news in there. It was entertaining. But this is very good about the press and the whole uh, the literacy. There's a number of other books that we carry in our gift shop uh, uh, about the syllabary and about uh, the press. And um, uh, like I say, you visit the museum gift shop or online. And I think we do. <laughs> When I left earlier today, we did have one, so, but, uh, you had a question? Oh, okay. any other questions, or, well, thank you for the honor of coming and kind of running my mouth today about something I find rather passionate. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.